Is that what it is? Fortune cookie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shall we open? <laughs> One more. Let's see. Okay, it says, um, think like a man of action and act like a man of thought. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Right, so you're gonna take that statement, mm. chew on it, and at the end of our conversation, our chat, mm. you'll use it either as a, like I said, in a comical way, yeah. but as a message in festive season, or if it's relevant yeah. to your company, yeah. or your philosophy. You let us know. I'll let you know. Right. Right, shall we start? Right, I'd like to thank you first and foremost for, for making the time to join us for our second installment of our Faces of Summer uh, 2022. And this is powered by Food for Mzanzi. All right, welcome. Absolute pleasure. No, it's very, thank you for having me. Um, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us. Right, I think so too. Right, look, um, for me, um, I'm, it's so important to sit with you because I, I think you, you play a very big role in the industry. And I think the industry needs people like you and the company that you represent. Uh, but before we, we talk about that company and uh, what you do, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get here? Yeah, it's been a long journey, Brian. But the one thing that I can say, tell you, it's been an exciting journey. It's, I wouldn't change any bit of my journey in the wine industry. So I started in 1991, I graduated matric, and then I went in 1993, I went to apply for a job at the old farmer's winery, the Moni's Division in Paul. And I literally went, I knew so little about the wine industry. I went for an interview at a spaghetti, you know, Fatties and Moni's at the spaghetti right, place. Right. Only to realize halfway in the interview, I was actually applying for a wine company. <laughs> so oh, that, was, that, was very, that was very funny. Um, but my history in the wine industry, actually this farm that we're sitting on, I used to jog past here every day. I used to, I was a long distance runner. Yes, you can't believe it, but I've been an 800 meters runner. Wow. So I ran past here, my family home is just down the, the road. So every day I ran 5Ks past here. And Niederberg has always been part of my, you know, um, I'm growing up. So I've always had a love for the wine industry, you know, this beautiful industry. And when I started to work at Farmer's Wine, it really opened up doors for me. Um, mm. And then I was soon promoted um, into the product development and innovation division, where I was involved in a lot of projects from spirit cider, art, are ready to drinks, wine. Right. And so my life in the wine industry is really a journey of complexity, excitement, um, learning on the technical side, I was an R&D, but also learning, you know, the marketing and the sales of wine. Um, so worked my way up and completed my BCom degree in 2017 um, mm -hmm. and my honours. And then I said that, well, I'm now vested in the wine industry. So yes. So wow, that's a journey and a half. It is. I've only taught you like a tenth of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's more? <laughs> there's much more. Well, it's a pity we don't have enough time in this interview. But yes, let's talk about your company and unpack your unit for us. Yeah, our company, Brian, unfortunately, also has a very long name. Yes. The SA Wine Industry Transformation Unit. It's a mouthful. But we've got nicknames for it. You can call it TU, you can call it We2, you can call it We2. I love the name TU. It's short and sweet. It says, it says Transformation Unit, and that's what right. we're all about. So the unit has been established in 2016 in October. So for about two years, the unit has been running without operations uh, um, head. 
and in 2019 I was appointed uh, but basically what our unit does it looks at the promotion uh, the showcasing um, the support and activities around black owned brands uh, black farms black professionals in the industry mm -hmm. looking at their journey uh, we also look at farm worker farm worker communities and how we can enrich the lives of people that has I would say previously um, in the industry but not fully recognized um, right. and which always played a vital role in the wine industry economy so now we're just giving it a little bit of a more of a focus if I can call it that and I must say it's been going very well since we've started uh, from early beginnings in the business mm -hmm. now for four years and going well so how many brands do you have right now that are You'd like to call them partners, right? The, the BOB brands, mm. uh, you call them partners? Yeah, we call them beneficiaries, partners, stakeholders, these various words for it, but I would say my family. It's my really my family. <laughs> so we are, have about 81 black owned brands. So it's, and, uh, it's basically people that owns brands like a trade name. Yes. And then we've also got 64 at the moment black owned farms, uh, people that owns land or in partnership with land ownership. Um, so within those two models, uh, those two scopes, there are various models. You get 100% ownerships, you get 51% ownerships, you get partnerships. So it's really a mix of various models. Um, and within those models, there's also certain very specific challenges and needs that need to be addressed. And that's where we come in to have that individual attention to each company um, and addressing their needs. Say, for instance, um if we were to make an example mm. of black owned farms, 51%, what, what, what would those challenges be? So on the 51% uh, black ownership structures is basically where a white farmer, if we can call it that, uh, for a lack of a better word, has decided to go into a transaction or a shielding agreement with their farm workers. So, I mean, you can understand the dynamics of this. You are a farm worker the day, and then the next day you need to go sit in a, a shielders meeting and be a director. Right. Um, so there's a lot of challenges with that in terms of management control where um, in the past you, we, you still found a very strong hand um, over the workers mm -hmm. and now we are putting the workers through a mentorship program where they are um, or teach or learn of how to be a worker and how to how equip yourself to be a shareholder and what questions to ask when it comes to a shareholder a shareholding and also the corporate governance with regards to shareholding because no, not a lot of people it's very easy to get signed into an agreement yes but when you look at the fiduciary duty as a director they need to be aware of that um, so it's 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 basically coming to an agreement where both parties understand each other, they mm -hmm. understand the role of themselves within that agreement. And also at the end of the day, what I normally say is that in a transaction like that, what is the real intent? The intent is empowerment. And if the intent is not empowerment, then what are we doing? Right. Yeah. Interesting. It's more complex than I thought. <laughs> So it's a place in Stellenbosch, it's a physical, physical place on the hill, yes, on the hill of Stellenbosch between, um, on the R44 in Halswachter. We utilize or, uh, an partnership agreement with the old ARC, the Agricultural Research Council, yes. and the Western Cape Department of Agriculture also supported us with this, with this initiative. And it provides a space of belonging, really a home for black on brands, where they can, if, so, if you ask a black on brand, where can I find your place or where can I find you, that is right. my address. The place is on a 250 hectare property, land, of which 50 hectares is planted, so you can only imagine yourself. I don't need to, 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 to give you this, another piece of the puzzle. Yes. There is a lot of opportunity. It's a facility where the brands can play into tourism and hospitality, so diversify the income other than wine sales. Mm. Indirectly playing the conference field, um, we also rent out the venue. We do wine sales at the venue, so you can go in, you can book a table, you can have a wine tasting, you can order food. Um, you can even do your 60th party or your, should I say, 20th birthday party yeah. there. <laughs> um, so the venue is open to be rented, um, and then, so that is phase one. And it's also got an e-commerce facility attached to that. Right. So we operate like a takealot.com for wine. So you can order your wine, province-wide, three-day delivery at a um, discounted rate for courier cost. Um, and then you can have a basket of products delivered to your doorstep. 
Mixed cases? Mixed cases as well. Christmas, watch out. We're doing Christmas promotions now where we will do hampers and um, special uh, Christmas hampers so that we can ensure that the black on brand is part of your Christmas uh, dinner or Christmas luncheon um, and you take it to the beach with you wherever you go. <laughs> and some of these products are not just wine, there are other agricultural products? At the moment, we're only catering for wine because it is a wine. The key objective is to sell wine right. from the facility for the brands. But later on, we will open it up for products from grape. So, for example, brandy, um, Need for Bay, the ARC has just launched the grape based gin. Um, yes. We will open it up for grape based products in future, but for now, it's focused on wine. Wow, that's very interesting. And it's got a tasting facility got a tasting facility as well. For all of these wines? For all, for all these 13 brands selected in phase one and we hope to open up that window again for new entrants to come in right. because it is really a, I see it as an incubation hub. So if you're a brand owner and you're trying to establish yourself, you don't have enough funds to have your own facility, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a kickstart into getting into the market and once you've earned enough revenue for yourself and profits for yourself, then you can graduate from the system and having your own. And we've already have about five brands which will be ready in the next four or five years to go to get there, to their own property. Um, so that's phase one. Wow. Phase two is very interesting. Um, next to the tasting facility, there is a boutique cellar. And we hope to expand that as well um, to have the boutique cellar set up so that the brands can utilize the boutique cellar to produce their wines. So it will be a, and you can, if you're a visitor, you can experience the wine tasting and during harvest, you can even come and harvest with us. So it's playing in the, in the arena of agritourism. That's fantastic. What a brilliant idea. Now back to the products. Now these B.O.B. products, are they selling off the retail shelves? So it's all dependent. So on the 13 black on brands, for example, we've done a detailed study on each one of them. So not all brands is directed at retail. There are brands that we call it lifestyle brands, right. where they are, um, so I would say under 100 rand, which fits perfectly into the retail space. But then you've got premium, super premium brands, where limited edition, uh, small boutique style, um, where most of these brands actually run out of stock. Um, we've got a few that you need to place your order well in advance. And we're talking about 250 up per bottle. Um, I think the highest product pricing on our product list is 470 rand a bottle, which means that they are more geared to the restaurants and hotel groups, or Rieka and the, the Rasa groups. And what we found is that sometimes when a re restaurant or a hotel group lists you, they don't want retail brands, you would know. Yes. So it's all about exclusivity. It's all about exclusivity, positioning yourself, understanding what your model is, understanding your pricing structure. And even within that scope, there's been a lot of work done this year with the brands. You do sound like a mentor too, right? I am, I am. I love, listen here, I started my own business in 2016 for lack of a better word, just trying. And I found out that I love uh, entrepreneurship. I love dealing with businesses that knows mm. where they're going, they're focused um, and it's just it just warms my heart to see companies grow. Right, we have a, a Chenin Blanc here. What's your favorite Chenin Blanc? No, you can't I have put to put me. you in a spot. My, Chen, my favorite Chenin Blanc is it will be launched next year. <laughs> Let's just put it like that. <laughs> so we'll have to have this interview all over again. We would have to. I've just told you that Chenin Blanc has never been my top number one um, cultivar. Yes. But in the last year, I've, I've, I've had a new appreciation for Chenin. I think the new style Chenin Blancs, um, with, with it, that's just fresh and more juicy and more vibrant. Um, but yeah, I don't have a favorite. I can't choose with too much children. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Very diplomatic. <laughs> right. In conclusion, back to the fortune cookie. So I can just read it to you again if you, if you <laughs> Go for think it. like a man of action, act like a man of thought. So I'm going to bring it back to woman leadership for me because the statement is a man, but I can put it into context of a woman. So, women is normally nurturers and we are normally action-driven candidates or uh, 
people in the sense of me being a project manager, so I'm very, I annoy people with getting things done. So action is there. But I always apply my mind with every decision that I make in terms of all three of my beings needs to be in contact with each other. My head, I use my brain. My heart, I use my sentiment. And then I also use my gut. Woman has got a very strong gut when they make decisions. So if there's one part of my being that's not aligned, I say no. So um, yeah, be a person of action, you want the work done, but be a person of um, depth in order how you make decisions. That's fantastic, I love it. Um, here's to the action and a Cheers. sip for the depth. Thank you for coming through. <laughs> Thank you.